Sometimes things don't work out like we thought they would or like we hoped they should. A couple weeks ago, I was at our a district conference for the missionary church, and I met a lady named Patty who was there representing the church she's part of in Portland. And, and Patty talked and told her story about how she had gone to school and she got a bachelor's degree, she got her master's degree, she got a doctorate degree, she started teaching in a university, she found a good school that she really liked teaching at. She eventually became the dean of that school, Concordia University. And as she was near 50 years old, she thought, this is where I'm supposed to be. This is where I'm going to retire. This is everything I've worked for. I have a nice place to live. I have a job that I love. But then Patty was given the news in the spring of 2020 that the school was going to be shut down. She finally felt like she had arrived, that she was in God's plans and God's will for her life. But those plans changed in the spring of 2020. And not just that, she had to experience the next two or three years of looking for work amongst the COVID pandemic and education was very difficult. See, Patty had plans, but God's plans were different than her plans. Some things we go through don't work out well, and they don't work out like we thought they would. Such as maybe we think, I thought I would be a manager by now in my job. I thought I would have children by now in my family. I thought my college education would have helped me more in my career. I thought I would be retired and enjoying those golden years at this point. Or I thought my children would have left home by now, is one I hear more recently, the last five or ten years. But when we find ourselves in those places where our plans don't work out like we thought they would or should, that's an important place that we need to recognize in our lives and interact with God in that moment. We need to see, ask, you know, what do we do when God changes our plans? What do we do when God gives us an answer we didn't expect? What do we do when God gives us an answer opposite of what we wanted? See, Habakkuk, the man, was in that place. He was living in Judah in about 606 BC, 607 BC, and he saw injustice and wicked in the nation of Judah. And so he cries out to God, asking about God's inactivity in Judah chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. He says, God, how long are you going to let evil go on? When are you going to do something expecting God to purge evil out in Judah? So God answers and says, I'm going to stop it. I know what's going on. I'm going to send these people, the Babylonians, to conquer the place you live, to send you through suffering. That's how I'm going to solve the problem. God, Habakkuk's question of God's inactivity switched to a question of God's inconsistency. Habakkuk then asks, God, why would you use someone more sinful and evil and wicked to punish us? To which God answers in chapter 2, you know, I have a plan, he tells Habakkuk. I've got a message for those faithful people, and I have a punishment plan for the Babylonians. And that's where we arrive into chapter 3 in Habakkuk as we're ending today. We've seen Habakkuk's problems in chapter 1, Habakkuk's patience in chapter 2 as he waits for God's reply, and now we see Habakkuk's praise in chapter 3 of God. See, Habakkuk, he's gone from why in chapter 1 to worship now in chapter 3. His faith has been tested he has been taught, and now he is triumphant in what God has revealed to him. And in these last four verses, we'll look at the problem that Habakkuk is going to experience, the position that he is in in verse 16, and then the praise that he is going to explain for us those last two verses. So let's look at the position that Habakkuk finds himself in in verse 16. Now, in this chapter, Habakkuk has been praising God. He says this is a prayer to the Lord in verses 1 and 2. And then he praises God, and he has this kind of theophany where he sees all these past things that God has done. He sees these appearances of God in verses 3 through 7, and then the amazing acts of God in verses 8 through 15. And then he continues here in verse 16, saying, I heard, and my inward parts trembled. At the, sound of my at the sound my lips quivered, decay enters my bones. 
and in my place I tremble, because I must wait quietly for the day of distress, for the people to arise who will invade us. In this verse, we see what Habakkuk feels and why he feels that way. First, we see what he feels at the beginning of verse 16, where he says, I heard and my inward parts trembled. At the sound, my lips quivered. Decay enters my bones, and in my place, I tremble. See, Habakkuk is about to collapse. He's almost paralyzed in this vision that he sees of God and the assurance that it gives God that things are going to happen in the future, the assurance that it gives Habakkuk that God will do things in the future. We see what Habakkuk feels, but we also learn why Habakkuk feels this way. He says, because I must wait quietly for the day of distress, for the people to arise who will invade us. This gives that explanation or the reason for why Habakkuk is trembling. Habakkuk trembles because he knows the Babylonians are coming to punish Judah for their sins. And he knows he trembles because of the power of God that he knows will sustain Judah through that judgment. Habakkuk trembles at the power of God's work in the past. And Habakkuk has this renewed confidence in God in the future. He knows something's going to happen, but he doesn't feel like he can do anything to change it. Now, who Habakkuk talks about is a little bit more obscure there. When he says, I must wait quietly for the day of distress, for the people to arise who will invade us. My translation here makes it sound like there is punishment that's going to come, and Habakkuk has to, he is trembling at the fact that Judah is going to be punished in the near future. But the NIV or some other translations take a different perspective on it. They say that Habakkuk is trembling and waiting patiently for the day of calamity to come on the Babylonians, which happens about 70 years in the future. But either way, Habakkuk is fearful for what he believes God is going to do, whether it's to the nation of Judah or to the Babylonians. And as we read this, it reminds us sometimes all we can do is just wait on God. Sometimes we just rest while we wait for God to work. And that's what Habakkuk is doing here. Habakkuk has really nothing else he can do but rest and wait for God to work. Nothing Habakkuk says or nothing Habakkuk does is going to change God's plans for the future. Habakkuk has been told these things, and now he's waiting for them to happen. He's learned how great God is, and how, and now Habakkuk waits for the great God to do what he said he would. And for us, part of us following God and worshiping God is learning there are times we need to just simply surrender to God's will, to trust his plans even if we don't like those plans. And that's hard for some of us to surrender to God and give up our will for his will. But sometimes all we can do is wait. Sometimes God has a plan and we just have to wait for that plan. Sometimes we think we know God's plans, but those plans don't work out. So we wait just like Habakkuk is waiting here. But waiting and resting is not going to be easy for Habakkuk or the other believers that live in Judah at this time. Because there are some things that are going to happen shortly. And that's the problem that Habakkuk describes in verse 17. He says, though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls. Here Habakkuk is describing the luxuries people would enjoy or did enjoy in Judah, as well as the necessities that they needed for life. Those luxuries are described first when he lists off the fig tree that doesn't blossom, the fruit on the vines, or the, the yield of the olive does not fall. Those are kind of more the luxurious things that people in Judah could enjoy. But the necessities there, the fields that produce food, the flocks that aren't part of the fold, 
and no cattle in the stalls. Those are more of the necessary items you needed to have to survive in Judah at that time. There would be no bread, no milk, no meat because of that, those items not being available. And what Habakkuk is really describing is this utter ruin that is going to happen, not because of a plague, not because of a drought, but through people, the nation of Babylon that's going to come and decimate the city, destroy their walls and their temple, take their livestock away, burn their fields with fire. That basic list there, they're not going to have anointing oil. They won't have vegetables. They won't have milk. They won't have wool. All of their needs will not be met. And as we read about Habakkuk saying these things, sometimes it's important we need to recognize that God will judge people and do what he says, even when those things are difficult, even when those things are not pretty. See, God had told the nation of Israel that if they abandoned him and walked away from him, he would send judgment upon them. If you're familiar with the Old Testament and the book of Deuteronomy, Moses takes the nation of Israel right up to the edge of the promised land. He shows them the land, but Moses is going to die and let Joshua go in. And so Moses recounts the law and regives the law to them, but adds a few things to it. And in Deuteronomy chapter 27, he spends 14 verses describing the bless blessings that will come upon the nation of Israel if they follow God and love God and do what he says. He lists blessings in those first 14 verses. But then in verses 15 to 68, Moses gives promises of curses. If the nation of Israel disobeys God, walks away from God, does not worship God, Moses lists curses that are going to happen upon Israel. And he summarizes part of it there in Deuteronomy 29, verses 49 to 51. Moses says that if the nation does not follow God, if they abandon God, the Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as the eagle swoops down, a nation whose language you shall not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, who will have no respect for the old, nor show favor for the young. Moreover, that nation shall eat the offspring of your herd and the produce of your ground until you are destroyed, who also leaves you no grain, no wine or oil, nor the increase of your herd or the young of your flock until they have caused you to perish." See, God told them what he was going to do. And when God fulfills his promises, good or bad, we shouldn't be surprised. And God did make those things happen. In our men's Bible study that meets on Mondays at noon, we were talking um, about Habakkuk. We were in the book of Philippians, but somehow we ended up on Habakkuk. And how Habakkuk was not the only prophet that lived during that time that we have in our Bible. Daniel, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah all lived at similar times as Habakkuk. They probably knew each other and were even friends. And Ezekiel and Jeremiah actually mention each other in their books, so they knew each other. But in Lamentations, the prophet Jeremiah lives through Babylon coming. He lives through what Habakkuk knows is going to happen. And the book of Lamentations records what occurs in the city of Judah, in the city of Jerusalem, when Babylon comes. Lamentations 2, 11 through 12 describes what life was like for the Israelites in Jerusalem when Babylon comes. He says, my eyes fail because of tears, writes Jeremiah. My spirit is greatly troubled. My heart is poured out on the earth because of the destruction of the daughter of my people. When little ones and infants faint in the streets of the city, they say to their mothers, where is grain and wine? And they faint like a wounded man in the streets of the city as their life is poured out on their mother's bosom. Then in chapter 4, verse 4, Jeremiah says, The tongue of the infant cleaves to the roof of its mouth because of thirst. The little ones ask for bread, but no one breaks it for them. <laughs> 
These things that Habakkuk was fearful of happening did happen as Jeremiah describes for us. God said that they would happen and they did happen. And for us that live in the age of the church in the New Testament, you know, post New Testament, we need to understand there are sometimes judgments that God gives for us too when we are sinful and disobedient and walk away from him. Galatians 5, 19 through 21, Paul writes about some of that. He says, the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these for which I forewarned you, just as I forewarned you, that those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. See, there are bad things that happen when we walk away from God or we don't worship him and we, we worship other things. There are penalties that occur in Christians' lives. One of the cartoons I like to read is Frank and Ernest. And there was one from last year when the, the, the prince from England was in America and there were some accusations that were going on and they had this Frank and Ernest that appeared a couple months later. Frank is reading the newspaper and it says, Wonderland News, Prince Charming in big trouble. And Frank tells Ernest, he says, it was bound to happen eventually. Snow White, Sleeping Beauty, and Cinderella met. And they realize there is only one Prince Charming. There are penalties for sin in our lives. In 1 John 1, 6, it says there'll be a loss of fellowship for sin. In 1 Corinthians 5, it says you can be excommunicated from the church. Hebrews 12, 6 describes chastisement that comes upon Christians that sin. And sometimes even physical death, Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 11. And that shouldn't surprise us, right? If you cheat on your wife, you should expect to have consequences if you survive. You speed in your car, you should expect to get a ticket and pay a fine. You cheat on your taxes year after year and you get audited, expect to have to work through it. You drink alcohol and you get a DUI, expect to pay a heavy fine, lose your license, and maybe even lose your job. So while verses 16 and 17 focus on Habakkuk's feelings, verses 18 and 19 focus on what Habakkuk does with what's gonna happen. He describes praise of God, first that God saves in verse 18. He says, yet I will exult in the Lord, I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Now there are 136 words in these four verses, but that first word, at least in my translation, yet is the most important word out of those 36, 136. Despite the judgment that's going to come on Judah from Babylon, despite the, the things that Habakkuk is going to have to live through, he says, yet I will exalt the Lord. This is not just the most important word, but it describes the most important response of Habakkuk. He has confidence in God to deliver him. And this salvation is not just spiritual salvation, but it's a material salvation too, that he believes God will sustain him and get him through it. And that word exult there is not one that we use often, maybe in our English language. It means to be extremely joyful. It means to rejoice. It comes from the Latin word that means to leap as well as dancing or to leap out or set out for something. See, Habakkuk, he does not just prepare to endure God's plans, but he is going to exult God through those plans. He does not just receive God's plans, but he rejoices in God through those plans. And we too need to rejoice in God while he works. We rejoice in God. There's a lesson here. We rejoice in God who will rescue us even when we know things will get worse before they get worse better. And that's what Habakkuk is doing. He is rejoicing in God, knowing that things are going to get much, much worse before they get 
better. And that's contrary to us in America. We're taught that, you know, we can rejoice and be happy and have inner peace when outward prosperity happens for us, right? Once I graduate, I'll be happy. Once I get that new job, I'll be happy. Once I get a better, bigger house or a nicer car or the newest iPhone or that better Verbo vacation, you know, then I'll be happy. But for Habakkuk, outward peace did not depend on his outward circumstances. For Habakkuk, inner peace started with who God was and what God said would happen. Habakkuk's feelings are not controlled by the events around him. Habakkuk's feelings are controlled by the God that is above him. Notice his circumstances have not changed from chapter 1 to chapter 3. He still lives in the same cities. He still deals with the same issues of sin, but his understanding of who God is has changed. We might not always be able to rejoice in the circumstances we're in, but we can rejoice in our God. And that's what Habakkuk is doing here. So he praises God as the God that saves, but he also praises God as the God that sustains in verse 19. The Lord God is my strength, he says, and he has made my feet like hinds feet and made me walk on high places for the choir director on my stringed instruments. What a contrast to how Habakkuk has started this book. In chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, he started out asking, God, why don't you do something? Then he asked God, God, why would you do that when God told him what he was going to do? Now he says, God, I know what you're going to do. I trust what you're going to do. And I have faith that you will sustain me through it. See, for Habakkuk, the source of his strength was in the Lord. He says in verse 19, the Lord God is my strength. Tony Evans says, when you know God's character, who he is, and his works, what he has done, you'll know what you, that you can trust him, even in the dark. And the source of Habakkuk's strength is the Lord. But Habakkuk always also gives a symbol of that strength here. He says, God has made my feet like hinds feet and makes me walk on my high places. Now my translation says hinds feet, but that's deer feet, like the feet of a deer. The Lord makes me strong like the feet of a deer. And the deer that Habakkuk is probably describing here, the mental image they would have in their mind is of the Nubian ibex deer. It's common in Israel and in Judah. It's not tall. It's only about two and a half feet tall at the shoulder. The males weigh about 135 pounds. The women, the females weigh about 65 pounds. They're not very big. They have small little horns that kind of go up, but then back and down. And they like to stay close to steep cliffs because that's what helps them stay safe. Because the Nubian ibex deer have a, have a hoof that's kind of split like this, that's flat. But when it gets pushed down and when there's a load on it, it grabs whatever it can hold on to. And that's how these little Nubian ibex deer can escape from predators and danger. They just simply go up. They find the steepest cliff they can and they go up it as fast as they can. And if you've ever seen pictures of them, they will be sitting there on a, a cliff like that just doing their thing, eating grass. One of my professors in seminary has done a lot of trips to Israel, and he says there's a, a three-legged Nubian ibex deer he often sees in En Gedi. And he said one year he went looking for that three-legged deer, and it was on top of somebody's roof eating some branches. Like, how does a three-legged deer get on someone's roof? But that's how they can, they can go anywhere. That's the symbol of strength that Habakkuk is giving here. Like a sure-footed deer on the highest of heights, God has equipped Habakkuk for whatever lies ahead. Like a sure-footed deer, Habakkuk, he can scale up any problem, any mountain, any trouble, and he can get away from things. So that's the source of Habakkuk's strength. That's the symbol of Habakkuk's strength. But also, there is singing from Habakkuk. 
as a sign of his strength. At the very end, for the choir director on my stringed instruments, he says, this strength and this praise that Habakkuk says isn't just something in his head that he thinks about. It is something he proclaims with his lips and probably does in community with other people. It's an emotional joy. He speaks aloud. And as we read about Habakkuk and the things he's going to go through and the praise that he has, we learn that we have to rely on God to get us through certain troubles. Like that Nubian ibex deer, sometimes we have to scale up mountains and we have to rely on what God gives us. And that's for us to understand and trust in God. If there's one thing we know as believers, it's that we still face struggles. Just because we're Christians doesn't mean we don't still encounter difficulties and troubles. It doesn't mean we still, we don't experience heartache. It doesn't mean we don't cry from time to time. But like that Ibex deer, when we rely on God to get us through, he will raise us up above those problems. And the thing about being high is you can look down and often see things better. And as we raise above those problems, we can get a better perspective of why God let us go through those troubles. God, that's why you closed that door. God, that's why you never promoted me. God, that's why you had me go through those trials. God, that's why you made me have a terrible boss for all those years. When nothing makes sense and everything falls apart, we trust God and we look to God to get us through it because we're supposed to take our eyes off our difficulties and place them on God. Because God's the only one that can help us get through certain experiences we have. Last year, there was a a thing that was going on that I read about. It was a former first lady that had a new book that came out called The Light We Carry, Michelle Obama. Seems like a nice lady that did a lot of good when she was in office. She has a heart for kids. She did a lot of good programs helping kids that were Uh, poor and it had to depend on school lunches and she made a lot of good focuses to make sure they got good nutritious food but in this book the light we carry she talks about faith and she relies on knitting she says is the faith sometimes we need she says we all have to have little things to help us be meditative in many ways she says it's like faith and she talks about quitting or not quitting quilting or knitting. Now, nothing against quilting or knitting, but there are some things we go through that quilting or knitting is not going to sustain us. We can only get through it because of God's help. He enables us and helps us to get through those troubles, to endure temptations. Mark Hitchcock, who is Pastor of Faith Bible Church in Edmonton says, The bigger God is to us, the smaller our troubles will seem. And the smaller God is, the larger our troubles will seem. When we worship a big God and we look to him, the troubles we encounter, they look smaller. So how would we summarize this book as we end our time today in Habakkuk, going through it for seven weeks? I think we summarize it this way. A mature faith is someone that trusts and submits to the Lord and his plans, even when that person can't see or doesn't always understand those plans. Habakkuk's complaints from chapter 1 have now been transformed into his confidence in God in chapter 3. In spite of the chaos of Babylon coming, in spite of the 70 years of exile they're going to experience, Habakkuk has a mature faith and he trusts and submits to God's plans even though he doesn't understand those plans. And in this passage, how would we summarize this passage? Habakkuk, he praises God even though he knows that judgment is coming and he trusts God to protect him through it. See, we can trust God to enable us to endure the trials that he has set before us because we can endure those trials before us when we look to the God that we worship above us. Let's pray. God, thank you for this day and us getting to to worship and be here. We pray for those members of our church family that aren't with us. Please keep them safe as they are traveling. And I pray for our church, Lord, 
that as we get to know each other and we spend time with each other in fellowship, we know we're all going through difficult times. Thank you for us having a church community that we can rely on to be there for us when we need it. And people that can encourage us and help us focus on you when those difficulties cease seem so amazing and so large in front of us. I pray as a church that you'll help us to focus on you, God, the God that is above us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'll invite you to stand for the benediction, and we'll be done for the day. On the back of your bulletin, there are um, the sermon titles and the books of the Bible we'll be in. So I encourage you to read those as we approach the next few weeks. We're going to do a, a series going through the one-chapter books of the Bible. I would tell you the sermon title, but I don't remember. Oh, postcard. <laughs> Postcards from God. Big messages from little books in the Bible. So we'll go through 2 John, 3 John, Jude, and a few other one-chapter books. So I encourage you to read through those, and we'll start that next week. Let us go in peace and in praise. Let us praise the Lord. As his creation, let us praise the Lord, just as his heavens, sun, moon, stars, and angels praise him. Let us praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Dismissed.